speaker, Vibeka Janssen, is a qualified veterinarian. Uh, she's got exper expertise in radiology and genetics. Um, her primary field of research is epidemiology, and, and she served as an expert advisor to uh, multiple EU agencies and the WHO. Uh, and since 2011, she's been a scientific advisor for the Dutch count at the Danish Council on Safe Telecommunication. Um, so, Vibeke, over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I will be talking about the biological effects of radio frequency electromagnetic magnetic radiation, in short, EMR, focusing on the substantial body of research that points to radiation from wireless technologies being harmful to insects. These effects on insects are particularly interesting because terrestrial ecosystems have a huge dependence upon the health of insect populations. Next, please. Um, the whole of our environment is affected by natural radiation. Through evolution, we have adapted to the the, envi the environment of natural frequencies. We all depend upon the natural frequencies and we are sensitized to it. This figure shows the level of radiation in the radio, radio frequency range at the gigahertz frequency range and below. Uh, the green shaded area shows the natural radiation level and the scale is logarithmic. So for each step, there's a 10,000, 10, no, no, 1,000 fold increase. In the radio frequency range, there's almost a void of natural radiation. This void has been utilized by living cells to communicate at extremely low intensities, but this has also been used by the telecom in industry because it's an almost void naturally. Therefore, there's been a huge increase in artificial radiation in this range. The red area shows the present exposure, which is 10 to the 18th higher than the natural level. Um, and it, at, in the in the intensive no in the frequency used for wireless communication. So if you look at the peaks in the red shaded area, it it shows the level used for telecommunication. This level is almost one per mil of the intensity of the frequencies from sunlight on Earth. So it's not as low as the industry wants us to believe. Furthermore, the artificial radio frequency EMR differs from the natural frequencies in many ways, make it, making it biologically more biologically active. This artificial radiation has also emerged in the nature due to industries' urbanization of both rural area and protected area. Next, please. Wireless telecommunication signals are now present in almost all our rural areas and wild spaces, here exemplified by Denmark. This, maps, this map illustrates protected areas in Denmark on the left-hand side, colored in blue are the protected areas. On the right-hand side is an overlay of the masks being erected. There are only few protected areas without full coverage. Before 2005, there was low coverage in the rural areas, but around 2005 to seven, mobile towers were erected in the rural areas in most of Europe. As a consequence, telecom radiation exposure of nature increased dramatically at that time. It would not have been possible for these areas to have been exposed to a chemical pollution in this way without a full assessment of the impact of that chemical upon nature. However, for radio frequency EMF, there's been no formal assessment of the impact, nor are there any specified safety standards for the effects of EMR upon the natural world. Next, please. So what has been done to assess the impact? In 2018, the EU Eclipse Project funded a review of more than 80 scientific papers investigating the effects on wildlife. This was not at all an exhaustive review. Nevertheless, it was concluded that some of the effects on wildlife are very well documented. These effects com comprises the physiological effects in plants, effects on insects, eggs and larval development, and effects on bird magnetic orientation. Regarding insects, 
There's also a range of high quality papers indicating further effects. As concluded in the Eclipse project, there's a large, bo large body of solid evidence showing that the exposure to radiofrequency EMR causes oxidative stress as in humans, and consequently genotoxic effects and death of insect eggs in the ovaries. Thus, the insect becomes sterile at radiation levels well below the current exposure limits for human beings. The eggs and developing larvae are highly sensitive. An array of other studies in insects show disturbance of the sense of orientation, memory, and learning, and changes in flight dynamics, all effects that cause failure to find food. It's, there are reduced reaction speeds, escape behavior, stress, and an array of physiological disturbances, such as uh, disturbance of the circad circadian rhythm. Studies on honeybees alone show reduced egg production due to effects on queen development and mating success. There's a significant e increase in DNA damage in honeybee larvae. There's a 20% reduced colony size, significant reduction in number of bees returning to the hive, significant effect on the social structure and reduction in collection of pollen, chem biochemical changes in worker honeybees and expression of piping signal as a symptom of stress. From this study, we can conclude that the radiation must have a negative effect on insects, also in the field, as the radiation level causing the effects in insects are now common in the environment. So what does this mean for biodiversity and our ecosystem? Well, as mentioned, very little has been done to, in to investigate the consequences. So let's look at it from another angle. In 2017, a study by Holman and Associates reported an almost 80% decrease in total flying insect biomass over a period of 27 years in 69 protected areas in Germany. This study was granted a conservation award by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds for documenting this, this decline. It documents that the decline in insect populations not only affects some individual rare species, it is the total insect population dying out. Recently, the findings have been supported by another paper studying the insect population in two large preserved areas in the Netherlands. The measurement of this massive decline in insect biomass was collated in conjunction with data on weather, land use, and development of the local habitats. These findings are very serious as the decline of the total biomass has far more, far worse consequences than if it was just a few rare species. Insects comprise the vast majority of animal species and our ecosystems have a huge dependence upon the health of the insect population um, because it, it's a key element of most terrestrial food chains. For example, most of the songbirds feed their progeny with insect larvae. When the insects disappear, food chains are disrupted and ecosystems collapse. In order to respond prudently to this crisis, it is crucial that we understand what drives the crisis. Holman documented that the steep decline in insect biomass was not caused by climate change. This is in Europe and, and actually a positive effect of climate, um, of this minor climate uh, change would have if you would have expected an increase in insect biomass. It was not due to changes in landscape and contrary to expectation, trends in herb species richness was weakly negatively correlated with insect biomass. So higher riches, richness were, and you, was correlated with fewer insects. Based on the observed pattern, the scientists concluded that there must be a large scale factor causing this decline. That is a factor which is present in most of the protected areas in all seasons. Thus, the factors that historically has, has driven the bio, a biodiversity crisis were excluded and the scientists concluded that the causal factor was unknown. 
if we look, look closer into performance data, it, the way he presented the data makes an illusion that the decline occurred at a, at a consistent um, logarithmic rate throughout the study period. However, for me as an epidemiologist, it is evident that this distribu distribution is skewed. That is, the data are not di randomly distributed around this straight line. The data, the data points were above the li line during some periods and below the line during, during other long periods, as illustrated by the fat red line on this graph. If the scientists had looked at the data for 1989 to 2000 only, the conclusion would have been that the annual decline was less than 2%. However, looking at data from 2007 to 2016, the scientists would have concluded that the insect population was stable. There are two very these are two very different trends and the ends do not meet at all. The data suggests that the insect population declined by approximately 50% around 2006, suggesting a dramatic event around that, that time. As described earlier, this period coincides with the rollout of the telecom masts in rural and, protect, and protected areas of Europe. I think we can all agree that the situation is severe which is also why Holman was awarded. The result by Holman indicates that the biodiversity crisis will not be solved solely by increasing the protected areas. Due to the severity of the situation, all potential causes of this massive insect decline should be investigated equally and immediately. And in the meantime, the precautionary principle should be applied to avoid collapse of ecosystems. To identify the causal factors, we must first look at Holman's conclusions. So any candidate, anything that should candidate to, a poten to be a potential cause should fulfill this criteria. It should be proven lethal to insects or <laughs> insect development. It should be affecting protected areas and it should explain a exponential decline or it should increase very dramatically in the period 2005 to 2007. Also, it should be large scale, ubiquitous, and, and uh, affecting almost all protected areas. So radio frequency EMR fulfill all the criteria pointed out by the Holman study. At, at present, we are in lack of any other factors that might explain this colossal die out of insects. Yet, and this is yet another reason to take a likely cause like radio frequency EMR seriously. Very few studies have been investigating the effects of radio frequency EMR in the field. This is a study by Lazaro as a rare example. It was conducted on two Greek islands measuring the radiation intensity in different distances from the mass. They found that radiation intensity correlated with a reduction in number of insects, but only for species nesting above ground. In the ground, the eggs and larvae are protected against radiation. And in Greece, being a very hot climate, many of the eggs and larvae are protected in the ground. But this is not the case, for example, in Germany. So these findings support the importance of the, support the, importance of the effect of the radiation on eggs and larvae. In lack of scientific studies, I would also like to mention this report from an Australian ranger with a scientific background. Mount Nadi is an Australian mountain located in a large protected area in Australia. In 2000, the first cell towers were erected on the mountain, and in the following decade, the number of transmitters and thus the level of radiation increased. During 2000 to 2015, the ranger meticulously observed and noted the presence of a wide range of species in the area within a three kilometer radius from the cell towers. He documented that birds, bats, insects, and plant species markedly reduced with each new antenna installation. Thus, in 2012 to 2015, there was an 80 to 90 percent less, there was 80 to 90 percent less insects than before 2000. In fact, 70 to 90% of the animal species 
were rare or extinct in this area in 2015. A very interesting observation was that during an extended period, the masts were turned off and species started to return, only to disappear when the masts were turned on again. This report is not scientific evidence for the importance of the radiation, but certainly it underscores the importance of the scientific findings and stress the importance of applying the precautionary principle. So what about 5G? There's no reason to think that 5G is less toxic to the insects. On the contrary, this study by Thielens show that with red coloration, the absorbance of the radiation in insects at different frequencies. The existing technologies are in the range around three gigahertz whereas the near field 5G is around 24 gigahertz, which is the range where the absorbance in the insect is the highest. It shows that 5G radiation is absorbed to a much higher degree by the insect. Thus, a 20% increase in radiation will cause a 740% increase in absorption in the insects. In conclusion, I think we can say that it's time to apply the precautionary principle. The ongoing collapse of insect population is causing severe consequences for the food chains, biodiversity and ecosystem. Radio frequency radiation causes cause oxidative stress. And we know that it causes effects on the reproduction in insects. And therefore it is a very likely explanation for the steep insect decline it's time to use the precautionary principle. Right away, the natural habitat should be, should be protected from high intensity EMF. The advent of 5G and satellite network makes this even more pertinent because there will be no escape. And there are indications that 5G is more dangerous to insects. The urbanization of nature by the telecom industry must stop.